is this actually the time for you to start into coaching, you the client? Because coaching is a sort of a trendy, cool thing to be doing. But if you really don't know why you're going about this and what you want to get out of it, it can be a little bit of a waste of time. So where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder centered leader. Welcome to Conversations with Coaches, where top executive coaches talk about the tools that shape their practice and then give them to you for free. This is a stakeholder-centered coaching production where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder-centered leader. I'm Brandon Murgard, CEO and Master Coach, and I'll be your host as we take you inside the Coach's Toolbox. Now, the best part of this season is that you get to keep the tools, all of them. In fact, we're giving away each resource to our listeners for free as part of our mission to measurably improve leadership effectiveness around the world. You can download all the tools at mgscc.net forward slash coach dash toolbox. That's mgscc.net forward slash coach dash toolbox. And by the way, if you're a certified stakeholder center coach, you've already got all these tools inside of your stakeholder center coaching coach portal. So get your tool today. For today's episode, we're privileged to have a true titan of executive coaching with us, John Reed. John is a master coach with Stakeholder Center Coaching, as well as with ICF and others. And he's also a fellow 100 Coaches member. John's impact goes well beyond personal coaching. As a founding fellow and contributing author at Harvard Medical School's Institute of Coaching, he's actually shaping the future of the discipline. His latest book, Pinpointing Excellence, Succeed with Great Executive Coaching and Steer Clear of the Rest, is a beacon for those seeking excellence from an executive coach. Off the clock, John is a dedicated mentor and philanthropist, serving on multiple boards and mentoring developing coaches. When he's not shaping the future of leadership, he enjoys spending time with his wife, Perry Ann, a healthcare executive, and their four children. Let's give a warm welcome to our very own John Reed. John, thanks for being here. Oh, thank you, Brandon. And it's it's a pleasure. And and as a fellow master coach, I'm again I'm honored. And the Goldsmith community is is wonderful in so many ways. So thank you for having me. Thank you. Again, I'm I'm so grateful to have you on the show. And today we're going to be discussing how leaders hire what what you call an, an exact fit coach. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And can you tell us what, what does exact fit mean? Well, I, I, um, I, I'll make this brief uh, because I don't, I don't want to take up the whole hour just on this topic, but, but Brendan, I got into coaching 20, you know, 20 some odd years ago. And I discovered that um to put it mildly, if you could chew gum and fog a mirror, you could call yourself an executive coach. And, and that was good. It was good to get into the market when that was the case because the bar was set so low. But over time, I began to get bothered by stories of executives spending a lot of money on somebody who was maybe well-intentioned and, and maybe very persuasive, but if you looked under the covers, they actually knew next to nothing about actual behavior change, positive, positive behavior modification, all, all, all the stuff that are, that, that is so important. So uh, I started to think about how can just little old me, how, how can I try and help us in the coaching field, raise the quality bar for consumers and I ended up uh, writing a book about uh, 2011, which was sort of how do you vet someone who says that they're an executive coach? That's the first thing. And then the tool that we'll talk about a little, in a little while is just in addition to finding the right coach of the right quality, is this actually the time for you? to start into coaching, you the client, Uh, because coaching is a sort of a trendy, cool thing to be doing. 
but but uh, if you really don't know why you're going about this and what you want to get out of it, um, it can be a little bit of a waste of time. So from a sales point of view, it's kind of counterintuitive to say, listen, it'll be great to get started, but let's just have a check before we do that. Is this, is this the right time or is this not the right time uh, for, for getting rolling? And so, um, so both in terms of the quality of coaches in the field and also the, since many of them are very aggressively marketing, what, you know, is this the right time for you, the client, to put your feet in the water and and enter into the process. So, uh, and then uh, last year, the, the book last year is a sort of an expansion on the one from 10 years earlier, updating based on what's going on in the co- coaching industry, both good and bad. Um, and and uh, I, anything that I can do writing or speaking to help consumers, um, I think the smarter consumers are, the more quickly coaches will will need to be equipped to respond to the market and those expectations. So that's that's what I'm, and that one of the reasons why I'm I'm so proud of being a, a stakeholder centered coach is that it's uh, highly researched and validated and. Uh, proven again and again and again. And um, I also am honored that if I remember correctly, maybe of the 5,000 or so certified coaches, what, 30 or so are master coaches. Uh, So I'm very lucky to be in that group. But with that comes a lot of responsibility to try and help the field continue to progress uh, it's a it's a discipline. I think it has a ways to go before it becomes a real profession. Uh, so, I hope I'm answering your your question, uh, Brandon. Totally, totally, John. Um, yeah, you know this this season is conversations with coaches. So our goal here is to have a conversation, and um, you know I think that you you're spot on in saying that the better informed our consumers are, the better all of us must become as coaches, but also the better the outcome of our craft. And that's exactly why we've pushed so much research and continue still the research projects we're undertaking. You know, if you, if you look, John, at our, our mission and our vision, uh, you'll see there is a specific line item to continuously research so that we can develop the world's most predictable, world's most powerful uh, coaching process so that consumers know exactly what they're going to get. I think this tool is uh, important for everyone. So um, before we get into that, give us a little bit of context about John. Okay, so at some point you noticed this issue. Tell us what was going on before that. Well, I I was sort of a, you know, a a traditional guy, Brandon. I went to I went to college and business school at at, uh, Dartmouth. And actually, that was in business school where uh, it was a little before he actually became a faculty member at the business school at Dartmouth. But once I was out in the real world, I started to hear about this, this guy named Marshall Goldsmith, who was a great coach and he was helping, you know, MBA students and so on and so forth. That's how I first started to hear of him. And then I would occasionally bump into him out on the, you know, out on the, the, uh, the road. I can remember in Houston at Memorial Hermann, hospital he was doing one of his patented you know for an audience of 800 million people he was engaging everybody and he somehow knew that i was there and very kindly invited me to show up and uh, uh he just he 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 was wonderful and so um i guess i guess i i really um i love coaching but maybe maybe what i could say is I started out in consulting when I finished uh, at Tuck, the business school, you basically either went into investment banking or management consulting. I went into consulting. I did that for 11 years and actually had a pretty good run. 
but surprisingly to me, uh, when I was sort of entering my early 30s, the highs were getting lower and the lows were getting lower, no matter how much money I was making. And I was confused about that. So I ended up going to a career counselor coach. And he said, do you know anything about adult development? And I said, I'm already an adult. I don't need to know anything about adult development. I was a great client. Uh, and then he said, well, I want you to go home and I want you to read about um, Eric Erickson, uh, a psychologist. And I said, well, why, why the hell would I do that? He said, I want you to read about the stage of adult development called generativity. I said, okay, I'll do that. But And generativity is the stage where many adults reach the point where helping other people becomes the biggest energizer from for them in life. And but of course I was resistant to that. I said, oh, that's BS. I'm a MBA. I don't, I, you know, I'm all about hitting the target and you know, blah, blah, blah. He, he was abs he was absolutely on target. So he helped me for the two years following that to look at becoming a physician, a minister, and finally I decided to go back to school and become an organizational psychologist. And I didn't even know what coaching was at that point. So anyway, and it was terrifying. I left my six-figure job to do this, and I was, you know, I, I, I and I really didn't know what the outcome would be. It was sort of a roll of the dice. Uh, but it turns out that if you're doing something that you're really geared to do deep down, it is intrinsically satisfying every day. And if you, you're lucky enough to have extrinsic rewards, which has been something I've been very fortunate to have, that's great. But the truth is, I do, I probably give away 15% of my time every year for free. Uh, to churches and I in the in the forefront program and the pay it forward programs of of the, our community happy to do that and I don't ever want to retire either I have a lot of business school classmates who are looking at their watch saying oh man you know in six months and four days and 12 hours I don't have to do this anymore and I don't I love what I do and I don't really ever want as long as cognitively and physically I'm I'm you know I have both oars in the water I don't want to do do anything else but that the counselor that I saw the coach that I saw in the late 80s around 1990 he passed away a couple of years ago but I owe everything to that to that guy because he helped me understand myself and he held my hand through, you know, sort of a terrifying change, but it turned out to be exactly the right change. So, so, um, and that helps sometimes when you're working with clients because some of them have this song that they started playing when they were 21. And when they get to 35, for some reason, the song doesn't resonate anymore. And they don't know why. And um, sometimes if you understand a little bit about development, it you can be helpful to them. So um, so I was very lucky in that sense. And then uh, I, I found within coaching, I, I found that trying to do the best possible job you can because you're privileged to be working with people who in many cases are smarter than you. And, and I, I learn more from most clients than they do from me. I'm pretty sure of that. So that's a privilege. And then also if you get intrinsic satisfaction and happiness from this, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's icing on the cake. And so I, but having that good fortune, I also feel protective of the coaching discipline. And so I, 
you know, I would love it if at some point to be, to be an executive coach, you really had certain things that you had to meet, right? So just like a, a physician has to go to college, go to medical school, do an internship, pass the boards, you know, those kinds of things, just just to play in the market. I don't think we have to be quite that involved, but I think we need to we need to set some standards. And so I, I the 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 writing and the speaking I do is around uh, helping coaches and consumers hone in on what I think are just ba- the the basic four areas that an executive coach should have depth in. And nobody really disagrees with this that I've heard. One is obviously business, right? Some some knowledge of business. Another is some knowledge of behavior change, resistance to change, so on, psychology, right? Another is ethics. I believe strongly that, that uh, ethics in an intangible process like this, where people are entrusting you with their professional lives. That's very important. And then finally, coaching itself, uh, getting getting trained in a reputable program. And, you know, the, the latest uh, statistics that I saw were that there were somewhere between 600 and 1,000 different programs globally that did, quote, coach training and certification, unquote. Now, some of those are founded in stakeholder-centered coaching, the ICF, the Worldwide Association of Business Coaching, and there are probably a half a dozen truly exemplary global organizations that are out there trying to set standards and raise raise the bar. But there are a a surprising number of other organizations that are founded by Joe or Jane Doe who thought, you know, what I need to do is just start offering coaching training. And I and if it's if it turns out to be two days of coaching training, but I can then tell somebody that they're a master coach because I printed a little certificate that says it, then they can go out in the marketplace and say, yeah, I'm a I'm a certified master coach. And if the if the consumer is not clued in, that sounds in some ways as good as what you and I have, Brandon, right? We're just certified master coaches. We've had to go through a little bit more than than just chewing gum. But so in other words, it, it the, the smarter the consumer is, as you said it so well, the better for everybody. Um, and I, I would say maybe these these books and and articles have been helpful for people who are also contemplating going into coaching. Right. Let's say they're an executive uh, with business training and good business experience if they come to me and say, well, what else do you think I need? I would say, well, you, you need to get some some training and coaching that's reputable and you need to get training in behavior change, adult development, aspects of psychology. Uh, and you need to be sure you're operating under a ethics code that is published so people can see it, like from the American Psychological Association or, uh, you know, the ICF or so on and so forth. So really pretty basic stuff, but um, I I developed uh, something that um, was copyrighted 10 years ago, which is just a a straightforward tool for doing a first level assessment of a coach in those four areas that you can, where you can actually sort of grade them to get a sort of initial ballpark picture of where they're strong and where they have gaps. And nobody's perfect, but if a coach has some gaps and they're not in some sort of program or process to address that gap, 
I would say move on to another coaching candidate. So anyway, that's a that's the Reader's Digest uh, version. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate the stories that you're sharing. Um, I think our, our audience does as well. Um, the <clears throat> just just to kind of rewind the tape and make sure I'm caught up. You're working as a consultant. This is at the backside of your MBA. You're doing this for I think it was ten or eleven years. Um, you you reach that beautiful point of diminishing returns where the highs highs a bit get lower, the lows get lower. Everything's just a bit more drab. You move into your PhD for organizational development, and through that you become a coach. And you mentioned a a stage that people get to where their their self actualization comes through helping people. I think that's relevant for everyone listening now. Can you tell us that what that stage is one more time? Sure, sure. And I'm hardly an expert on on all of this, but I've just from personal experience, Eric Erickson, E R I C K S O N, Eric Erickson, who was a notable uh, thought leader and psychologist uh, years ago, developed a model of stages of adult development. So, sort of stages that inevitably adults will go through with challenges, but opportunities to resolve those challenges and and shift the direction of your life so you have fulfillment and satisfaction um, that's that's sustaining. And the 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 one that I've learned the most about is called again generativity. Generativity, which I'd encourage any anybody thinking about being a coach to go just get familiar with. But basically, it it is a movement from the natural self preoccupation that we all have when we're eighteen or twenty or you know we're we're coming along. We're focused on moving ourselves forward hitting whatever the targets are that that are put out in front of us. But it's a shift to to realizing that maybe what we're cut out to do in some ways is to help other people around us succeed more than focus on our own success. Or maybe another way to put it is our happiness and success however you define that, becomes more a function of what we can do to, as Marshall says it so well, pay it forward, help other people. Um, And incidentally, that's another wonderful thing about the Goldsmith community is that it really does embody this notion that we're, those of us who are lucky, uh, have an obligation uh, and an opportunity to to pass forward what we what we have and for example Marshall's graciousness in in his knowledge philanthropy is extraordinary it's extraordinary and I think that is inspiring a lot of people myself included to be sure that you know for the for the last quarter of my life I I am I am focusing on what I can give back to make to make the future better for for the next you know for the next generation. So uh, lots of things about Marshall and this community are, are really uh, are a privilege to be a part of. Absolutely, and it's, this is making me think of you know the last time you and I were in a room together was in Nashville, Tennessee, with a hundred coaches and. Uh, a lot stuck with me from that, as I'm sure sure you as well. What a, a an experience! Something's coming to mind, which was Dr. Kim talking about um, talking about optimism and how easy it is to be pessimistic. And he said, optimism is a moral obligation if you want to uh, affect the world. And I think you're you're absolutely right. Marshall has exemplified that. Set the role model for us. And now, you know, you're here doing exactly what he did on a slightly different scale. You're here giving away um, a tool that you've developed to, to do what uh, my friend Mitchell Livy calls uh, incrementally improving the industry of coaching. Um, And so uh, I appreciate that. 
I'm also, uh, as you mentioned, Eric, um, there's one of my favorite academics, Eric Dahan, um, in the UK, uh, uh, one of his papers published this year opens with the efficacy of executive coaching has not been proven beyond doubt yet. And I think, I think the way you're, you're unpacking this is important. So as we increase the barrier to entry for coaches, I think we'll see a lot more competition at the upper echelon uh, of, of skill set and accessibility to executives. And I think it will eventually go sort of the way of the, let's say the NBA, you know, it can be $15 to buy a basketball and shoot hoop with, hoops with your friends and help your local bakery have better leaders. And if you're the president of XYZ Corporation, you'll pay the big bucks for a coach and there's not a lot in between, but that means we got to make the skills ubiquitous. And we're doing that here with your tool. So you see this problem. Clients are hiring coaches with not enough experience. Tell me how you sought to solve that with this tool. Sure. Sure. Well, I, I actually realized with the help of my, it was my wife who, who actually is, is the most astute person, certainly in this family, there's no question about it. Uh, but, but she knew that I was putting a lot of effort and thought into how to help buyers identify to go back to what you said, the best qualified, best fit, highest ROI, you can use lots of different terms, person for them. And that that's all well and good. But she also said, you know, maybe it would be helpful for you to try and help a client also think through whether it's the right time for them to be to be involved in this. Because, you know, people have, a, in some ways, a romanticized view of executive coaching, like I'm going to I'm going to come in and I'm going to be working with somebody and there's a magic wand that's going to come out and abracadabra, you know, and and when I was a rookie coach, Brandon, this is this is worth mentioning, I was so insecure and so ignorant that if I had someone who would just compliment me and say, you know, that it was great meeting with you, John. And uh, yeah, you made a good point. I, I like the point you made about if that person really had no idea what they wanted to accomplish, except to be able to say, I have an executive coach, because that's the fashionable thing to say. I was too insecure to pick up on that. I was thrilled if somebody said something nice about what I was doing. And, and so I, I, in the early going, I was not able to be selective enough to also say, I, I'm so happy that it looks like this is a good fit and we can get, we can, we can work together, but let's take one other check and say, is this is this the right time for you? Why is this the right time for you? Uh, and if it's not, let's say the right time is two years from now, right? Or there's certain things developmentally or things you want to resolve. I'll be right here. I'll be happy to work with you then, right? So this this tool, um, and actually it's you know it's just a uh, it's just a one pager. I've tried to consolidate it, but basically, it's it says, "Is this the right time for me to make the investment, not just of money, but psychologically, of opening myself up to learn about strengths and weaknesses, to to go through the hard work of changing habits and developing new positive behaviors?" That is that is not easy it's very rewarding once you've done it but it's not just hey let's let's uh, have a glass of wine or or a cup of coffee together and suddenly that will happen um and and so what what is it at the end of the day now the first question i ask almost every client whether whether it's a ceo or uh someone who is trying to build a business, an entrepreneur, I say, well, all right, so good that we're, we're, we're getting started now. 
if we could hit a home run, right, or some analogy that everybody understands, if we could hit a home run and get 100% out of coaching what you want, a year from now, what would that look like? And sometimes I get, absolutely, I want to be ready for X. I want to be promoted. I want to be... Uh, I need that. I need to be much better at this particular skill. Uh, I need to, res- you know, if I hear some evidence of thought and and reflection and self awareness, then I and motivation, of course, then I feel good about in general moving forward. But if I get that sort of pregnant pause and a blank stare and a and sometimes someone will say, well, I, I thought you were supposed to tell me what I was, what I need to get out of coaching. Then that's exactly the point where I say, let, you know, let's, let's tap the brakes here. And, and maybe it's just a little thing that we need to resolve, but ethically, ethically, I, I feel like it's the right thing to do to have a checkpoint where you say, this is the opposite of sales, okay? I'm I'm not pushing for you to sign with me. I'm pushing for you to think about whether this is the right time for you to sign with anybody, and why is that? So, um, ethically and and also practically, it just it just seemed like the right thing to do. And of course, the the way to, to the way to make it most most accessible is to sort of boil it into a page with just some some things for thought starters, things for people to think about in their situation to determine whether this is the right time or actually no, maybe I I need to to be getting a couple of other things squared away before I I do this. As our conversation unfolds, you may be wondering, what is this whole stakeholder center coaching thing? It's a leadership development process that guarantees leaders become both recognized and acknowledged as more effective leaders by key stakeholders in 12 months or less. Nearly 5,000 coaches have been trained in this methodology. The coaching program is designed to build functional expertise from three stages, intellectual, practical, and applicable on the job. In addition to graduating with the most rigorous research-driven coaching methodology on the market, You'll also walk away with measurable coaching results and a lifetime certification to show for it. We don't just believe in what we do. We stand behind it. And that's why we are giving away complimentary access to the first stage of the training to anyone listening to this podcast. Get your very own access code today by visiting mgscc.net forward slash sample dash course. Let's tune back into the interview. For our listeners uh, who aren't sitting in front of the computer, um, I want to give you just a quick orientation of the the tool that we're looking at. Um, it's titled, Do I Need an Executive Coach Right Now? Why or Why Not? And then it has eight very thought-provoking questions with about a paragraph, a sentence to a, a short paragraph um, prompting to help understand why the question is important and what to do about it. Uh, and this is the tool that we're that we're working through that John is sharing with us here. Um, you know, you you touched on something, John. I think that's also worth pointing out. Um, you mentioned uh, the you know, on the topic of moral obligations. We do have an obligation to not say, "Oh, you want a coach? I'm that guy. Here's my contract. We're good to go." But to get them to think. And my personal personal belief is that that is exactly what sales is supposed to be. It's supposed to be first deciding, do they have a problem that you can solve? Not do they say they have a problem? Do they really have a problem? Can you really solve it? If they, if you can, in fact, make their life better, you do have an obligation to help them make their life better. And if they don't, you have the equal obligation to not sell. And I think if we can press that point to coaches, especially with such a, a fast um uh, growing set of coaches in the industry, we can make it better for all of us. So, John, can you can you again orient us? What are these eight questions that you 
that you walk uh, a leader through as you're using this? Sure. Well, and it, it, these are, I would call these sort of pragmatic reminders. Uh, but these are when you're when you're sort of in the emotional upswing of wow, this is exciting. I'm I'm you know I'm I'm. It's like you're at the Indy 500 and you're about to get into the car and you know. Um, it is to say, do you first first question is very simple. Do you understand what executive coaching is all about? Right. Sure. Sure. It's supposedly a trendy, cool thing, but what what is it all about? And what it really is about is you, the, the first word that I use is it's work, right? And it's, it's you and your coach working together to help you build more effectiveness, impact, satisfaction, acquiring new skills, building self aware There are all kinds of new, new things that you're adding or some dysfunctional things that you're going to be shedding right but but that is going to come about by a, a consistent commitment by you and the coach right to because it's going to take some persistent effort anything worth worth doing is is going to be demanding for really good results so that's the first thing and that naturally leads into, am I motivated to commit time and energy to succeed in coaching? And so the, the message underneath that, of course, is that, yes, it will take time and energy to make this successful, as, as, as you would have to invest in anything that you want to make successful. So they, it takes work both in coaching sessions, and I like to say, outside of coaching sessions or between coaching sessions, because a lot of what we do in a session is, is develop some, some new approaches and rehearse them, for example. And then I want that person to take them out on the road, so to speak, and do a lot of test drives with, with the situations they have at work. Right. And then to come back and say, okay, well, here's a situation where it seemed to work well, and I think it worked well because of this, and here's what I experienced. And then there were these two other situations where it, it seemed to sputter, and I began to feel nervous, and I backed away from it, and I, uh, I, I, you know, I felt stuck. And those are all very helpful things to talk about. And then we retune, and we, you know, we go back out. You know, I, it's like learning how, if you're a baseball player, learning how to hit a curve, right? You, you, you can talk about it, you can look at video, and then you ultimately go out and you start swinging at the ball and you come back and you, and you process what that was like, and then you get some more advice and so on and so forth. So time and energy. And then this is more about motivation, am I at a point professionally where achieving more and differentiating myself in the market is actually valuable? Do I really think I need to do that right now? And certainly if you're a COO and you want to become a CEO, then there are certain things that you need to learn how to do. And, and there's, there's a pretty clear target. Um, and actually, if you're a CEO and you're you're realizing you could be achieving a lot more as opposed to coasting along. That's another example. But if it's sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm doing pretty well. And I, you know, I don't have a lot of fire in the belly and I, I actually could sort of poke along for another year or two. That's often the point where I say, well, you know, I, this is a lot of money for you to be spending just to poke along. I don't, I, I don't, I'm not sure this is the ideal fit for you. Um, sometimes it might be. Um, so do I have clear measurable outcomes? That's something that, am I ready to examine both my strengths and my weaknesses? Now that seems like an obvious question to those of us who live in coaching all the time, because that's, that's what we're, what's, that's what we're doing. 
That's that's we know that that's the lever by which you get better. But at the same time, actually, sometimes we're the only people that this executive, maybe a C-suite executive, that we're the only person that that person doesn't have to maintain a facade for where they can be vulnerable and they can say, you know, actually in that meeting the other day, I had no idea what to do. But of course, I'm supposed to convey equanimity and and focus and calmness and and all these other things. But sometimes that's really not what's going on. So so what am I really good at and where do I need to get better? And and sometimes confronting that is is challenging for people, even though they cognitively know, oh, yeah, the only way I'm going to get better is by is by capitalizing on my strengths and addressing my weaknesses. But uh, that's they're surrounded usually by people who will resist like the plague talking about their weaknesses because there's no upside. Usually there's no upside. Um, Okay. And then if you have a boss, okay, does my boss support my development and growth? Okay. So if you happen to have a boss uh, and the boss is actually focused on being constructive uh, giving you good direct feedback about both your accomplishments and your your need for growth and acknowledging and encouraging your progress and so on and so forth. That's great. Uh, if you have a, a boss that frankly thinks that this is just coaching is just something that we're going to give you because it's going to make everything wonderful instantly. Uh, or it doesn't really matter what you do and how well you do it. The boss is still going to be adversarial. That, you know, no amount of coaching is going to help that. So, um, and then likewise, in your organization, does my organization's culture actually encourage and support leadership growth, stretching, and at times, inevitably, making mistakes and learning from them, right? And I, you and I, Brandon, have been in lots of environments where the politically correct wording is, oh, of course, we want people to ask for help. And we, if you don't know something, please reach out for help. Or if you're confused, we all get confused. So there are no stupid questions, right? Uh, and the first person that puts their hand up and says, you know what, I, I'm so glad to hear that because I was clueless. Sometimes that person gets clobbered, right? And so does, do you really have an organization that is encouraging the stretching and the occasional stumbling that is part of building new skills, right? Um, and then the, the, the last one is, you know, sometimes, uh, I will see someone who, and I have enough clinical training, so I'm able to identify things like anxiety, depression, uh, narcissistic behavior, so on and so forth. Uh, sometimes someone will be in coaching and it's obvious that in addition to whatever agenda we have for skill building, right, there is, there is underneath all that, it's obvious that there is uh, a mental health or clinical challenge, which we have all had from time to time, uh, related to family or related to health or a whole bunch of different things, where uh, the the person may a couple of things can happen there and i'm sure this has happened for you brandon you can then do what you can to help them locate clinical help which they can have from a clinical psychologist psychiatrist uh 
or counselor or other other mental health professionals and you can have that in parallel with the coaching that you're doing sometimes i recommend that they stop coaching and spend a few months getting clinical help and then and with their permission, I, 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 I'm allowed to converse, communicate with the other provider, the mental health expert, so that I can understand how they're doing. And then I, when the mental health expert says, I think this person is now at a point where they can come back into coaching, or they can come back into coaching and continue in mental health care, we, we sort of coordinate that way. But but uh, uh, what I what I also have this question in here for is so that if a person is actually mainly in need of mental health support, that they they have some chance to recognize that and get that taken care of first. Because honestly, if that isn't taken care of, it doesn't really matter how how effective coaching might be, because you won't be operating, you know, at a at a normal capacity where you can begin to take advantage of it. And and uh, all of us in life are at those stages once in a while, and and uh, so. That's a that's a kind of a quick run through. And again, none of these things are groundbreaking, but they are often overlooked or not fully confronted, which is why I just I just tried to make this this little summary available um, for folks. Well, you know, I so appreciate you getting into the mental health side of things and also your perspective on um uh, let's say coordinating with some mental health professional, because this is an area where coaches should be very clear where their line uh, starts and ends for their, for their expertise. And there's so much that goes into the, the psyche that coach training has never been designed to address or in the best case, it addresses it in an inappropriate way. You, you hit the nail on the head. You hit the nail on the head. Yeah. So, you know, making this, accessible to people and sharing your story, I think is, uh, is, is great. So take me through implementation here, John, I'm a coach, I'm listening. I'm thinking, boy, I'd sure love to use this resource. I download it. I read through it. I've got a contracting call tomorrow. How do I go about using this practically? Sure. Well, if you, if you, if you have begun to learn something about this person in the process of getting to the point of signing a contract, I would say, first of all, reflect on that. What, what have you been hearing? What is your gut telling you? And, and it, 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 and if they're at the very least, what I would, would say is have a, have a conversation where you don't go into all of these things in all the detail that you and I just did, but where, where you think it might be relevant, just work into the conversation uh, some of these topics and see what kind of reaction you get, right? So that, so let me give you an example. If you have if you have someone that um, uh, uh, is under a lot of, obviously under a lot of pressure, right? And you, your your sense is that that they're you're, you're wondering how well they take care of themselves, right? Let Let's just say you notice that they perhaps are are overweight or they. Uh, it doesn't appear that they're taking the best care of themselves. And you, you, because I inevitably will talk with clients about them being the asset. And a lot of this is about asset management, right? How, how well is 
the client taking care of herself or or himself. So if you if you see that, sometimes that can can lead into a, a chance for you just to explore a little bit about what else is is going on. Um, so to answer your question, I would say trust your instincts and explore a little bit of what you're seeing and you want to clarify a little bit. I would not say, you know, methodically go down through all all eight of these because, um, you know, that that would be like uh, that would be just not appropriate or helpful. And then I would I guess I would also say in my in my standard agreement. It talks about how if mental health issues are become apparent in the course of coaching, this might be something to just talk about, then it is my ethical obligation and professional obligation to do everything I can to help the client access resources to help them with that. Uh, to do ever, everything I can. So what I can sort of set is the, I wouldn't call it a regular expectation, but I would say an expectation that from time to time, this will happen. And if it does, I have enough training to sort of spot it. And if I think that with your permission, Mr. Client, if I if I get a sense of that, I will ask you, and and if it seems like we're we're really on target, then my job is to help you get the help you need there, but perhaps continue coaching, coordinate with that person, so on and so forth. So you're not giving the feeling of abandonment to to the coaching client also. And you know, if I could just say one other thing, Brandon, many people who are in coaching are there because they want to be helpful, you know, which is admirable. And many of them are compassionate and and empathetic and, uh, you know, wa- and want to make things better. So give yourself a pat on the back if you have those feelings. And at the same time, just recognize don't fault yourself if you're not clinically trained like a psychiatrist, right? Uh, the best thing you can do to act on those good instincts is to get the person in the right hands of someone who can help them. And by the way, that experience of of working through something in, in the in the mental health side of things will only help them learn about themselves and be more inclined to sort of dig into some things later in coaching. If they come back to coaching, I'm sure you know that and have seen that, but. Yeah. You know what I'd love to do, uh, John, I, I am realizing, you know, not only have I not run into, um, let's say friction due to mental health in an engagement. But if I did, I wouldn't know who to, who to turn to, to ask for advice. And I would be willing to bet that there's many like me. Um, would you be willing to let people reach out to you if they have questions about oh, sure. towing that line as a coach? Sure. Of course I would. They can, they can email or, or, or I'd be, you know, I'd be happy to, to chat and, and, uh, um, we, this is something we all continually learn about, and um, and you know, given given the pace of change and and the the escalating demands on on leaders, I would say the odds of us seeing uh, significant stressors, mental health challenges, um, is going to go up. So so. Um, how can people get in touch with you if they've got a question and want help? Sure. They can they can text me at um 832-215-4018. They can email me at john at 
Quinn Reed Associates, Q-U-I-N-N-R-E-E-D Associates.com. Also, I'm on LinkedIn and and uh, you can some people reach me that way. Um, so I'm, I'm I, my my schedule gets pretty, pretty packed, as I'm sure lots of people's uh, does. Uh, but as quickly as possible, I'd be happy to to do anything I can to help. You can access all of the tools at mgscc.net forward slash coach dash toolbox. Um, and you can also email us podcast at mgscc.net. That would be if you have guests to recommend, uh, if you have questions you want us to ask, or if you just need a shortcut to these uh, to these resources. Or, and I think this is so important, if you are coaching a leader who does exhibit some potential signs of mental health distress and you're not sure what to do, as I wouldn't in that case as well, um, we will be digging into our network and seeing who we can connect you with. Because like John said, we are here to help. And the only way to help is to make sure that we know what people need and help them get it. So good. Yeah. So I get this resource. It sounds like there's no magic about the sequence of questions or even the wording of questions. It's more important just to have the prompts for a discussion. Yeah. yeah. Just you use your own words and use your own skills in inquiring, uh, you know, tactfully and gently. And sometimes your, your instincts will be, uh, you'll find out that everything is basically fine and that it's something else entirely but but you don't you won't learn anything unless you inquire so i would do it i would do it gently not aggressively and i would i would do it um in an exploratory way and i would also be emphasizing that this is a confidential relationship right that's another anxiety that a lot of senior leaders have, if they have an issue like this, the, the last thing they would want is for someone to find out that they're actually struggling with it. Unfortunately, they because that's that's not part of the facade management expectation. So make sure that they know it's completely confidential, and all you're do, all you'd like to do is understand and, if possible, help find the right person to help them. Something I really like about what you've done with this tool, and for those of you who haven't downloaded this yet, pause the episode, go grab it, um, is under the questions you have a prompt that kind of walks through why the question is relevant and how to process it. Um, and it's very, it's very direct. And I think it's also very realistic. I think it's reasonable. So I'm looking at, um, let's say, am I motivated to commit time and energy to succeed in coaching? One of this, the last sentence in the prompt is, if you have many other demands, wait until your schedule has room. So it's not over-optimistic. It's not saying, hey, this is the most important thing in the world, just get it done. It's actually giving very concrete guidelines that anyone can follow and ask themselves to determine whether they're ready for coaching or not. And I think that or not is the exploration that most coaches don't help their clients on. It's more about why you should and I think that's very admirable uh, and it shows a lot of integrity. So thank you for that. And thank you for sharing it as well. So, you know, John, I'm curious, any good stories using this tool? Anytime you've uncovered something that you wouldn't have otherwise or had a particular challenge using it or even a funny story using it? Well, as I said, the, you know, the, what comes to mind immediately, Brandon, are the, were the moments when I was so green and insecure and that I just desperately wanted a, a client who liked me or thought I was doing a good job. So that's the other extreme. That's the not desperate, but very, very focused, salesly, salesy, let's land another client, um, that kind of thing. I think I've, I've, I don't know if I have any funny stories. I, without naming names of a senior leader who had basically it was pretty clear had a substance problem that was creating behavior problems that was essentially the reason why the behavior problems were why I was contacted and brought in but I I and this was a uh 
attorney in a big in a big firm. And the reason I was sort of brought in I, it was more than just sort of, hey, let's let's just let's just identify some behaviors that you may not be seeing landing in the way that they do, right? In other words, it 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 was it was clear in the discussions that there there was much more going on because the behaviors were generated by to put it simply not having both oars in the water and having lots of other things going on that had nothing to do with the practice of law and and that's when i i said initially to this person i think it'd be a good idea if we get you in touch with and i'd already from prior work i knew that that this firm used a certain person for this kind of situation i i then went to the right person and said is it could we could we approach this person but the client was sort of resistant to that and understandably this was a case of sort of addiction and so if you really are addicted the last or the most difficult thing you can possibly be faced with is confronting it and having to work on fixing it um, so there was natural resistance which confirmed for me that this was exactly what the the real problem was and so there was no point in proceeding with with coaching at that point and and eventually things did work out um but it was it was difficult and it you, you know it usually is usually is so but to try and try and remember that at the end of the day you want to be able to say i ethically and practically did what i could do to be helpful for the right reasons um to to this person and also in some cases their family and and other other people who get the ripple effect mm -hmm. well you know this tool is really geared at helping coaches to vet the clients to make sure they're a great fit uh let's let's flip that coin around now and say hey if i'm if i'm an organizational leader or an organization we're looking at bringing in a coach we want to make sure we get that right fit what advice would you have for that person or that organization i would probably give them a copy of uh, the, the book from last year which is a sort of a buyer's guide it would be two stages to put it very simply stage one is understanding what their level of depth is and competence is in those four areas and there's some very simple there's some things you, in the book that you can do to do that and then if they so if their score is high enough so to speak so that you think that they are capable of delivering what you know what they could deliver in other words in terms of education and training and experience they can deliver then the next step is to have an interview with them, but not just a sort of a let's talk about the weather and and the uh, local sports team and, you know, see what the quote chemistry is. Chemistry is important, but this is more about understanding a lot of intangible qualities. And in the book are 50 questions that are easy to use to guide the conversation so you begin to understand what this person's problem solving approach is or what this person's self awareness is like or what this person's there there's some basic things that you can learn that go far beyond sort of chemistry so the second stage is to to really have a, a you know 45 minute conversation maybe an hour conversation with your coach to see if if the fit in that way is also good. So first step is, does this person have the training, education, experience, so on and so forth? Second step is, does this person in the intangibles, in their personality, in, in how you feel with them, to some degree about coaching, but but, a little, but actually a little bit more of that, does that also fit? And if those two things fit, then the odds are pretty good that this is the this is the right person. 
for you. Um, so I, I would, I would, I would sort of go about it that way. And this is from pinpointing excellence. Yes. 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 Okay. We'll, we'll put an Amazon link, um, in the show notes. And then this tool also, is this from the, the pinpointing excellence book? Well, it actually, if you, if you get the book, then the, the last page of it has, has a web, has a link where you can go get this and download it. Um, but for people who are listening, since they can already get it directly from you, they can do it that way. But either way, they'll they'll be able to also get the, do I need an executive coach right now? Why or why not? Perfect. Good. So, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, one more time, when you download the resource at the bottom, it's going to have um, John's email. It's going to have the website pinpointingexcellence.com where you can also get this tool. And we'll also include in the show notes uh, some of John's, uh, uh, the LinkedIn email um, and other ways that you can get in touch with them, especially, especially if you're in a situation where you're seeing some some early warning signs of potential mental health or mental health distress uh, in your coaching. So, John, you know, it has been a joy to have you here. Um, as we wrap up, one more time, could you let our listeners know how can they reach out to you if they want to talk more in depth about the tool or about any of the topics we've discussed sure. today? Well, Brandon, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's been it's been wonderful to to have this conversation, and I I hope it's been helpful in some way. And and LinkedIn is a place where they can send me a message. Email is again just John J O H N at Quinn Q U I N N Reed R E E D Associates Plural dot com, and then texting is just 832-215-4018. And um, I, 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 hope, uh, I hope everybody listening has, has uh, found something valuable. And I want to compliment you, Brandon, on your, your ability to, to uh, lead discussions like this in such an effective way. Thank you, John. I really appreciate that. Um, my hope is that this serves the community. And as you and I both are, are passionate about, let's, let's raise the standard for coaches and let's make sure that as, as an, an average, we are providing an increasingly better service yes. to our clients. Yes. So um, again, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question that you'd like to ask, if you've got a guest you'd like us to interview, you can email us podcast at mgscc.net. Uh, if you like this tool and you're interested to know more about it or any of the other tools from the series, you can get them for free at mgscc.net forward slash coach dash toolbox, mgscc.net forward slash coach dash toolbox. If you're stakeholder centered certified already, this is all inside of your coach portal. So you can get it anytime. And there you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, my guest, John Reed, thank you for joining us in this episode of Conversations with Coaches and where we can share this, this amazing tool to help clients and coaches better understand whether now is the right time and whether this is the right coach. So you can find all of their links, their social links, email in the show notes. This has been another episode of Conversations with Coaches by Stakeholder Center Coaching, where we believe everyone deserves a stakeholder centered leader. Thank you for joining this conversation. And until next time, remember to keep learning, keep improving, and keep taking your coaching skills to the next level.